These are my top recommendations for anyone struggling with frequent or chronic gas. Now, gas can be coming up the top through belching, or it can be going out through the other end through flatulence. Now, bloating also is considered as gas production, but bloating merits its own video. And so that one will be addressed at a later moment. This video is specifically for uh, gas being produced up and down and what we can do to help solve that problem. Now, first, before we really get started on the solutions, it's a really good idea to understand the reasons why gas gets produced in the body. And as we talk about the solutions, you'll be able to identify, oh, this is why I've been having gas. Oh, this is what is causing the gas to be produced in my body. And these are the techniques that I can do. Usually someone that has had chronic gas throughout their life, uh, it does seem to come back here and again because ha dietary habits can be hard to break long term. And there is kind of a slippery slope. And when gas gets reproduced or it comes back up again, you'll be able to say, oh, I understand the reasons why now because you've watched this video and uh, you'll be able to easily solve for it the future times it does come up. Now, gas falls into the category of indigestion. And so what also is in this category of indigestion, which is also things that will be uh, going, that we'll be going over in future videos. In this indigestion uh, topic, you'll have a lot of things that fall on top of one another, meaning that like therapies that work for gas production will also work for maybe like diarrhea or constipation. And so also what we will find in this indigestion category, so you have your burping, you have uh, flatulence, you will have bloating. Now bloating is basically like burping and flatulence, which is gas that has, mo that has movement. Bloating is gas that has no movement. And so bloating is like flatulence or burping, but with constipation. As in, uh, you have stuck, trapped gas inside. And when something has low movement, you go into the constipation. So basically gas plus low movement constipation equals bloating. That's what bloating is. And so helping the bloating go through the body, resolving for constipation is also usually a helpful technique when solving for bloating. But we'll talk about that in a different video. With burping and with flatulence, these issues already have a lot of movement and we're trying to resolve the gas that's being produced. Besides the belching and the flatulence, you also have constipation, diarrhea, you also have like IBS, Crohn's, you have just this wide variety of indigestion. You also have like motility issues such as like gastroparesis, which is a type of constipation. Uh, and you also have like celiac and other like food intolerances, but also those will be a different uh, video entirely. But because they all fall under the same category, there are things that will have applicable dietary recommendations that do go through everything. Because these fall under the same type of category, you're going to have some uh, recommendations that can be applied to multiple indigestion types of uh, symptoms. So what determines if it's a burp coming up the upper end or if it's flatulence coming up the other end? You know, when you have gas being produced, if it is in the stomach, or in the upper part of the first part of the intestines, that is going to be a burp causing type of indigestion. And usually this happens as you're eating or within 30 minutes of eating. If you have a burp from uh, close to a meal, that means that the gas that's being produced is almost immediate. Uh, if it's coming out the other end, now that is going to be more later in the meal when, or more later in the day when the meal has had time to go through transit. And so uh, you're, so usually flatulence is going to happen hours after a meal. And it can be a little bit more uh, tricky to say, 
that's the reason why I have flatulence or that's the reason uh, why I have like an uh, upset lower intestinal problem because you're more detached from the meal that actually caused the issue. So this is how gas gets produced. When you have a food in front of you and you eat it, you are going to chew, you're going to break down the food. You're going to then have that food be swallowed. It's going to go down to the stomach. The stomach is going to physically also break that up a little bit and it's going to start secreting enzymes, chemicals, that are going to further help metabolize, break down, dissolve that food. As that food goes then into the digestive system, the first part of the um, small intestine, you are going to then continue breaking it down. However, if the body in the stomach or in the small intestine or even the large intestine uh, gets a food that you have eaten and it says, whoa, I don't know how to break this down. I don't have these enzymes to break this down. It's going to say, I'm going to send you food guy that I can't take care of to the guy next door. And he's going to break you down because I just don't have the tools necessary to do this. And the guy next door, those are gut microbes. And they're going to take this thing that the body can't digest. It's going to move it to the side. And microbes are then going to digest that food because they can digest almost anything. And they're not going to simply digest, they're going to ferment. And when you ferment, you create gas. Uh, insert any type of like bubbly, fizzy drink that has caused the fermentation. Insert any kind of beginning stages, the gas phase of fermentation. Uh, when you first open a newly fermented food, there is always, always gas. There's always bubbles. And this is the reason for gas production in the body. In summary, when the body gets a food that it cannot digest, microbes take over and they digest that food and they create gas. That gas, wherever that position in the body is, whether it be in the stomach, creates a burp. Whether it be in the upper parts of the small intestine, creates a burp. If it's lower down, it'll create may maybe rumbling inside, maybe bloating. And if it's even farther down, it'll then create flatulence. It depends on where these microbes are being called to help. Basically, gas is your body saying, I can't digest this food. Hey, microbes, I need help. The microbes come in and they do break down that food. But as a byproduct, they're going to create gas. Now, with that in mind, you can effectively tell where your body needs help with digestion by the type of gas that you are producing. If you are having a lot of burps, that means that the uh, enzymes in the upper half of your digestive system need assistance need opening up and you can do dietary changes to help open up these pathways. Or if you're experiencing more flatulence, that means that more of the large intestine second half of your digestion or later half of your digestion does need assistance. And then what you can do to help assist that so that as you are creating food into stool, that stool comes out of you without there being excess gas produced because your body can break down all of your food effectively. Now next, and I would be remiss if I missed this point to talk about the gut microbiome, the gut microbiome is going to be really heavily influenced in this type of conversation because uh, no matter who you are or what you're doing on earth, you are going to have a gut microbiome. And this gut microbiome is going to influence your digestion and it is going to be present in your body. Everyone has a gut microbiome, whether you try to outwardly influence it or not. In other words, what I mean is that the person that doesn't have any fermented foods uh, or even like no fruits or vegetables or like no like fermented products, no yogurt, no, no anything, they're going to have a microbiome. 
and the guy next to them that's like a fermentation fanatic who has a fermented food at every meal. He eats pickles, he eats yogurt, he eats, he's a fermentation fanatic. He also is going to have a gut microbiome. Both of them have a gut microbiome, but it is entirely possible that the person that's not trying to outwardly influence this gut microbiome with specific foods, uh, they are probably going to have more gas production just because there are less helpful microbes being introduced into the system to help break down these foods to ensure easy digestion so that things come in and go out smoothly. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that you need to have a fermented food at every meal because you can get microbes from more quote unquote raw products. When you have a raw vegetable, there are going to be microbes on that. When you have a raw fruit, there's going to be microbes on that, being that it is grown in a non-pesticide heavy practice. If you were to have a raw cheese, there's going to be microbes in that. If you were to have a type of fermented product, there's going to be those uh, microbes in there. If you are to have raw milk, that will also do that. If you have fermented food, here I have lacto-fermented carrots, there's going to be microbes in here. If you were to have like a pickle, there's going to be microbes in, in that type of food as well. And so there are a ton of possibilities for the system to have microbes introduced into it. You do not have to be a slave to gas and you can outwardly control the gas that's being produced. And even uh, I have had a bunch of people do well with gas prevention just by introducing gas relieving herbs and spices. So you don't even necessarily need to have an introduction of good bacteria, although it is a fantastic idea and I will never be against that. But sometimes also just having the right herbs and spices to knock out the excess gas producing microbes in the body and opening up these digestive uh, enzyme systems. These herbs and spices can also help uh, relieve gas in the body. So what does this mean? This means that my first recommendation is to intentionally add beneficial microbes into the gut to help with digestion. So this can be, of course, fermented foods, such as like yogurts or even like a homemade pickle or sauerkraut. Or for example, if you're doing fermented foods, you would add in like herbs and spices that would also then influence your gut microbiome, which leads beautifully into my next talking point. These are the most common herbs and spices that I have found to be the most helpful in relieving gas. So first, you have peppermint, and this is usually used as a tea, loose leaf tea would be best, and you'd want it to be strong enough for it to create an effect. And so this plays in beautifully to uh, most traditional meal practices where you would have a meal, then afterwards you would have a calming peppermint tea, for example. Next, and actually my favorite one, is fennel. And so fennel, I keep it in this old mustard jar and it works beautifully. And this is actually the one that I use because I used to struggle with uh, gas myself, uh, like many other men. Um, uh, and this one, this fennel seed has been a game changer for me for my digestive fluidity, uh, no gas, uh, digestion, and ease. What I do is I just throw a bunch of these into uh, a meal that I'm making, whether it be like a casserole or even honestly in my favorite way is my morning eggs. And it might sound a little bit uh, different, but I want to say don't knock it until you try it. I really like it uh, along with some salt and pepper and maybe a little bit of thyme. It's really, really good and I highly recommend it. What you can do is you can toast these herbs and well, technically it's a berry because it's a fennel, it's a fennel seed and seeds are berries. Uh, you can toast them, you can grind them using a mortar and pestle, and that way you're releasing more of the fennel seeds properties to help with the gas uh, relief. Now, next, what I'm getting into more and more uh, is, of course, ginger. Ginger is a fantastic gas relief type of food. 
I just didn't grow up having it that much, so I'm not used to having it as much, and I'm learning how to do it. But I have other people, and I see online that people swear by it. So, of course, ginger, and just, of course, you know, chopping it up and throwing it into your meals, or even having a ginger tea post-meal is a fantastic way to add it into your daily diet. Now, three others that I have had uh, success with, but I don't use as much personally because, you know, I found my favorites. They work and I continue to use them. But three others would be uh, cumin. You also have anise. I love anise. I actually have it in a glass and I make a hot tea with it at night. And that's fantastic with some cinnamon and some nutmeg. And it's just fantastic. And these are just, you know, chopped up spices. And then also... Uh, chamomile, but that's more for sleepy time and it's more of a muscle relaxant rather than uh, a gas reliever. The gas is relieved through chamomile because it relaxes the muscle in a different type of uh, sense. You also have uh, uh, caraway and, uh, and I already mentioned cumin. So those are my most often used herbs and spices to address a chronic gas problem. Now, for someone that is trying to address this type of issue, I will say that consistency is key and sufficiency is key as well. So you need to be doing it on a regular basis at every meal and enough. If you're not adding enough of these herbs and spices to your meal, especially if this is the type of approach that you are using, if you're not using enough of them, you won't see a result. And so you may leave feeling frustrated, but I would say before moving on to trying something different, I would say make sure that you really are ramping it up. And I would say I would highly encourage you to stay with it and maybe use a wider variety of herbs and spices. You know, don't just do fennel once and then, you know, say it didn't work. Do it for a few meals, a few days, see what works, see what doesn't work. Uh, everyone's different, so we're all going to have our preferences. I personally love uh, fennel. Others love caraway seeds. Others love, you know, ginger. You know, you've got all of the Asian continents that use ginger, you know, religiously. And uh, you just have to find the one that works for you, but you also have to find the one that works for you and use it in enough high enough quantity for it to actually cause an effect in the body. So now interestingly, and more of a side note, if you were to go into the supplement industry and you are to see uh, what supplements help relieve gas, because of course they are out there, there are a lot of people that have gas and you know, supplement industry wants to provide a solution. Uh, you will see that the capsules, when you look at the ingredient list, you're going to see a Latin you know, official name of these herbs and spices. You won't be able to really decode it because they'll have their Latin name, but it will be fennel or it will be uh, you know, the herbs and spices that I listed in just before. You'll also see more bitter uh, bitters. Uh, so in the sense of like artichoke, uh, black radish, uh, you may even see some like mustard type uh, ingredients and then more like herbalistic types of approaches such as like club moss, for example. Now, these are going to be my two main preferred uh, gas relief supplements. So first you have Gasalia, and this one is a um, the herbs and spices that I previously mentioned. Same thing in a capsule form that you can very easily take, and as you'll see from the ingredient list here. And then the other one that I prefer is this one from Gaia Herbs for gas and bloating, and you will also see that they use a lot of fennel, and so they just reinforce you know the kind of recommendation that I have. You know, I do say that. Having the actual herb is better than a supplement, but if you want a supplement and you're on the go, that can also be helpful, especially if you have very intense uh, gas that you're trying to solve for. Now, these are just two of my preferred supplements. There are other ones out there, such as a more overall blanket digestion help with added enzymes and added plant materials, etc. But because these are so blanket solution and they may help, 
They don't help you identify what the actual problem is because it's so blanket. Also, one other thing that I'm not a really big fan of is as I look at the ingredient list here, I'm seeing, you know, for example, protein digesting enzymes, uh, and I'm seeing protease thera blend. Uh, it, you know, I'm seeing fat digesting enzymes, light paste thera blend, and like I get it, and it can be helpful for someone that's really having a hard time with digestion. But when you add these plants. Uh, herbs and spices that help break down foods and help break down and cause easier digestion. Uh, that is actually helpful and the body understands that. But when you add in, when you take in something that the body is supposed to be producing, as in you're eating an enzyme that your body should be making, uh, you kind of tell the body, you don't need to make this enzyme anymore because I'm eating it now. And so you kind of downregulate that type of digestive help. And that's more of the reason why I'm not a big fan of these digestion supplements because that have these artificial enzymes in them because they do downregulate internal enzyme production that your body should be producing. That's one thing that you do not want to, you know, turn down. If anything, you want to ramp it up by amplifying herbs and spices that open up these pathways to make these digestion, these these internal digestion enzymes have ease and flow into the body so that the food that you're eating can be easily digested. Now, one other thing that I'm going to touch on before I finish up is the topic of having activated charcoal as a solution for a chronic gas problem. You're going to see this ingredient in quite a few supplements and I don't technically have a big problem with it, but activated charcoal does uh, knock out both good and bad, and it does bind vitamins and minerals uh, while also addressing the bad that's causing the gas in the problem uh, in the body. And I'm just not a fan of this type of approach, just because there are better solutions out there that do uh, address the gas without robbing you of your internal vitamins and minerals. So that's going to be it for this part one of this digestion series. And in this next part, in this multi-part series, I'm not sure how many videos there will be, but I'll talk about how vinegar can help with protein and fat digestion to help facilitate uh, ease, through the, ease through the digestive tract. And we'll talk about digestive bitters and how that can help with, uh, and so that is more of an alcohol-based, uh, bitter-based, uh, approach to help address both gas and address a yeast yeast infections, candida, those types of approaches, and where its place is in a dietary protocol and what we can do to make sure that that is an effective protocol that does work for someone that does have a gas or indigestion slash bloating problem. So we'll start moving away from addressing just pure gas through, uh, you know, belching and flatulence to more overall gas and having also bloating being addressed in this next video that's coming up. I want to thank you so, so much for watching. And uh, if you like this video, please be sure to give me a like and subscribe to stay up to date with my content. And if you like what I'm doing, my name is Matthew Kress of Kress Dietetics. You can find me here on YouTube on my website at crestdietetics.com and on social media. I want to thank you so much for watching this video and I will see you in the next one. Bye.